today I'm going to do a story time, even though I know story times are not trending anymore, but that's what I feel like doing today. This is one of the stories I want to share with you. It has to do with getting sick in Indonesia. And it wasn't me that got sick, but I was there. Um, this story happened a while ago, quite a while ago. So if I say like a number, like in rupiah, then double it. Because this was like over 10 years ago. So like, the double in aja gitu ya. I had a partner and he came back from somewhere to my class and said like, he collapsed. Like his legs gave out and he had a hard time getting up afterwards and said there's something wrong with his legs. I just said, oh, just wait a couple days. You know, maybe it was just like your foot fell asleep, semutan atau apa, nanti sembuh sendiri. And the next day, I saw it with my own eyes. So like he goes outside to get something and then he comes back and he collapsed outside of the door of the class and he couldn't get back up like you kind of have to carry him and i thought all right well we can't wait any longer now we have to go to the hospital um i didn't have a lot of money at the time but i think i had 1.8 million in my bank account so double it 3.6 in today's dollars so i'm like yeah okay let's go to the hospital because it seems to be quite serious like he can no longer like walk by himself it was so fast um, I was living in like a cost, like the cost itself was like so cheap, man, that I was living in. So it was 350,000 rupiah a month and the floor was like this. So like if you sleep, you have to sleep with your head here <laughs> and your feet down here. Otherwise, you, you're just not going to be able to sleep. The floor was crooked and outside the front of the cost, like there's no road. It's just like you have to like walk to get there. and it was like in front of a creek of garbage so it was just really gross it just like smelled like garbage it was like disgusting but like it was close to my school so i was living there i didn't have a motorcycle and and you know what i don't even think motorcycles could get to that cost um so i think it was about 700 meters to the main road maybe 500 meters or 700 meters to the main road so i put him on my back um, and luckily he was a small man. <laughs> so I put him on my back and I carried him on my back, like piggyback to the main road. And we grabbed a taxi and we went to the hospital. And we waited there for a couple hours. And while we were waiting, he said, it's moving. Sa. It's like, it's moving up my body. Like it starts with his legs, right? And then all of a sudden he's feeling it in his chest. And by the time he got to, to, to see the doctor, um, the doctor made him like shake his hand to test the strength in his hand. And he could only do this. Like he couldn't shake somebody's hand. He could only do this. And so it was moving very, very quickly. So they said that he had to stay overnight. They told me that um, they needed a, a deposit and I only had 1.8 million. So, uh, the deposit they needed was 1.5. So that left me with 300,000 rupiah for like my own food and his food if you wanted like Susu Bear brand or whatever he was asking for. And um, that was fine. So he got checked into the hospital bed and he said, don't call my mom because I don't want her to worry. But it was going so bad, <laughs> so fast that I worried something bad, something worse would happen. So I called his mom. And by the next morning, his mom arrived. In the meantime, they were just doing tests, tests, whatever. So his mom came, she took like this economy bus. It took 12 hours on an economy bus to like get to the hospital. And I'm so happy that I did call his mom. It was really nice. And so when his mom got there the next morning, of course she was talking to her son. And then she said to me, Sa, Ngapain di rumah sakit, Sa? Ini harus dibawa ke kampung. Nanti dijemur. Biar sehat. Ini mahal. At this time, he was already on the oxygen because, like, he couldn't breathe. So the paralysis, yakni lumpunya, it went from the legs 
very quickly up the torso to the arms and it was making its way to his lungs and his jaw was already you know becoming paralyzed so dia kunya bubur aja udah susah so he would take two or three bites of bubur and then be like i'm too tired so i'm like there's no way he's going to make it back to the village you know like no no we're doing it this way but then the doctor came in and told me that after the tests that they had done they found out that he had a GBS or in Indonesian they call it SGB and this is like a really rare disease virus thing um it happens in like 1 in 100,000 people and yeah it's very rare it's very difficult to diagnose so i was very grateful <laughs> that they were able to diagnose this in like uh, in a, like it was like in no time they had it diagnosed they said that the deposit that i had given them that was 1.5 million was finished because it, you know it was eaten up by the cost of all the tests and that he needed to go to an ICU because it was moving towards his lungs and they would eventually you know possibly eventually stop working altogether so um the little oxygen thing that he had on cuz he was like I can't breathe so they give him oxygen um that might stop working if his lungs stop moving by themselves so he needed the ICU and the hospital did not have an ICU at that time I said well what happens if we don't get an ICU and he said well he's probably going to die so i'm just like okay um he's going to die then cuz i only have 300,000 rupees so i said what about if we just rent the bed alone without the treatment and then you know like he can die here in the hospital bed and they said we can't do that because because the hospital bed was only 60,000 rupees but you can't get it unless we're getting treatment and we can't afford any other treatment like an IV and all that stuff everything costs money right tita bisa you can't just rent a bed you have to you have to pay for everything like the doctor and the treatments and if you if you're not getting that you have to leave so i'm just thinking all right I'm going to have to call a taxi, rip the oxygen hose from his nose <laughs> and get out of the taxi, put this man that can't even breathe on my back, walk with him on my back like 500 meters, 700 meters to the cost. And then I'm going to have to watch him die of suffocation in this shitty little 350,000 rupees cost right in front of a creek of garbage and there's not even a bed there because I used to sleep on the floor on a mat what a horrible horrible thing to ever have have to like happen to anybody like and i'm just thinking not only is it horrifying for me to have to witness that happening to somebody else but like i can't even imagine what was going through his mind at that time and i thought kokujamya like this is real life this you know this one in indonesia you that's it was so real it was so i don't know it shaped the way i think um the story gets better <laughs> anyway so with that image in my mind i decided i have no choice i have to get somebody to help like with money because he needs to be in an ICU I want him to have you know that uh what is that uh the breathing machine yeah that's what he needed I didn't want to ask anybody for help but like if it's life or death then I will ask I called up one of my like ustazas I told her what was happening I didn't ask her for money I don't think she had a lot of money but maybe she would direct me to somebody who did within a couple hours of calling her a Saudi ustaza came over to the hospital who also um was a a teacher at my school 
and she drove up in her Audi <laughs> and she handed me an envelope with five million rupiah cash inside the envelope. And I was just like, oh my God, maybe he's gonna live. <laughs> so I got on the phone right away calling all kinds of hospitals like, which one has an ICU and how much is the deposit? And in Jakarta, the deposits were all like 7 million, 7 million, 9 million. Some of them were higher. Uh, but I did find one in Bogor who, who only asked for 5 million. It was the perfect amount. And I, and, I, and I booked him in and we called an ambulance and we were going to save his life. So he was really happy because he had, he had already... He'd already signed off. He was already confessing to me about like, Sa, I, I, Churi, I am, Dari Tatanga, Waktu Kachil, blah, 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 Kamu Harus Bayar Kembali, yeah? <laughs> um, stuff like that. Like, we were already saying goodbye, and all of a sudden I'm like, I got money, we're going to go to the ICU in Bogor, come on, let's go. So in the ambulance, he's having like, he still has a little oxygen tank on, I think, and, um, but he's, he's having more and more trouble breathing and he's suffocating and he's saying, I can't breathe, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. And I'm just like in the ambulance, like praying, like yelling to the driver, like, can't you turn the siren on? So they turn the siren on and the car still wasn't moving because Machetnia, because the traffic between Jakarta and Bogor at that time was just like so horrible and it's worse now. <laughs> this was a long time ago. But then I'm like, oh my God, it, it, I don't know, just, my mind is just racing. Um, I was just praying that he would be able to breathe long enough for us to get to the ICU. So we arrive at the ICU and my legs started tingling too. And I was getting diarrhea too. And those were the symptoms he had before this started rapidly happening to him. So I, I asked the nurse, is it contagious? And then they're like, pss, 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 pss. well, it is a virus, so it's probably contagious. I mean, like, Whoa. and then they looked at me and said, I don't know, but I heard everything they said and I'm thinking it's fucking contagious. And then what are we gonna do? <laughs> we'll have nobody, right? Because uh, his mom had already gone home um, because they have like 20 kids in their house <laughs> and like, they don't have much money, so she had to go back and like deal with the rest of her family, and it was just me and him at this time. Anyway, so we got to the uh, ICU. He got in there, you know, it was looking good. Um, I was getting symptoms, but um, you know, I wasn't paralyzed yet. <laughs> and the next day, I was able to speak to his doctor, and he gave me. Um, some good news and the good news was it was not contagious and my symptoms went away like immediately <laughs> I was uh, quite grateful for that the bad news was the money was gone five million does not go far <laughs> and they said we need more money or else he has to go home and he's still in ICU still needs that intensive care right so I was forced to call somebody else I really, really don't like doing that. But again, it was like a life or death situation. So I called up somebody who I considered a friend and I knew that they had money and possibly could help. They said, well, that's a horrible story. Um, my grandmother is sick too right now, so I can't help with much, but I will send over some money. And they arrived. Uh, her driver or whoever, her assistant, showed up with uh, an envelope with 15 million in cash. And it's like more money that, you know, like that I had ever even held at that time, you know. It got him through another night at the ICU and then the following day they said he can, he's stable and he can go to a normal room and he had so many visitors, like even, like even, hit, like all of our friends were poor, but they just poured into the hospital in Bogor, and um, some of them even bought him a wheelchair. <laughs> I know money's tight for students, and they all chipped in, and they bought him a wheelchair and, you know, other things. And I just thought, like, that, you know, 
this one Indonesia. Like, they're not going to sit back and watch anybody die. Um, they're going to do everything they can according to their ability. And I just thought it was, like, the most beautiful thing. We knew that he was already paralyzed. And the doctor said that, you know, like, he might be paralyzed for life or he may recover. Um, but at that time, we were in the hospital for five or seven days in Bogor, maybe, maybe a bit longer. And uh, they said, there's nothing more we can do. Um, you just have to wait and see whether or not he can regain his ability to walk or not. So, so he was paralyzed and he was released from the hospital. There was like two million rupee left over after paying all the hospital bills. So I called up that woman again, the friend I, who gave the 15 million to us and I said, there's money left over, I'm gonna send it back to you because there's nothing more that they can do, and he's stable, so he's going to live, but I want to give the money back. She says, no, don't, don't worry. Keep the money. So uh, we bought him an air conditioning unit, which was like a luxury at that time. Um, I hadn't lived with air conditioning for, <laughs> for a long time. Yeah, it's a luxury, and it's nice. When you're paralyzed and you have to be in a room all day, <laughs> most of the day, um, yeah, that was good. And he survived. And I think about eight months later, he was walking again with a limp. And now he's surfing. Well, not really. He's kind of old now. <laughs> but he was surfing again. He was walking normally, you know, within a year. I think he was back to normal. A little bit of a limp for a while. And now he's, like, completely normal. And I just think that was one of the most influential experiences during my time in Indonesia, how hardcore it can be. Um, but also, like, they diagnosed him faster with this rare disorder, virus, disease, whatever. Um, they diagnosed it so much faster. And after I went on the internet reading about people with this rare illness, um, you know, oftentimes, in Western countries, in Canada, I think the forum was like a Canadian forum. Um, they misdiagnose people all the time. They, they'll send them home with like horse tranquilizers and tell them to get a lot of rest. Um, and here I am in like Mampang at some like random hospital and the doctor diagnosed it like, like I don't know, within like 15 hours. So I guess based on, and everybody has their own story, but like, yeah, I guess based on that, I have confidence in, in um, Indonesian doctors and Indonesian hospitals. It was a bit harsh facing the fact that if I can't pay for it, then I'm going to have to carry this man on my back and watch him die in my costs. But at the same time, as soon as I told somebody all of a sudden, just like, the envelopes just showed up and the people take care of the people. But as a Canadian, I always thought it was the government that's supposed to take care of you, um, which offers some comfort, I guess. But it doesn't mean that in Indonesia, you will end up dead in front of the hospital. I'm sure sometimes that does happen. But if you've been doing your Salat Rahmi, if you've been a nice person and a kind person, and you know, they're going to come. Your family and your friends and your network are going to come, and they will save your ass. And that's why they're so big on Salat Rahmi here. Um, sometimes in my older videos, like, I'll make fun of some things, and people have this different perception of me. Like, they don't get my jokes, or maybe my jokes aren't funny. But, like, anyway... Um, I just wanted to share my, uh, my story, but I would trust, um, the Indonesians to save my life, um, cause I, I, I saw them, uh, save his life. It's, it's much better if you have your own money, uh, uh, you know, your own protection. Um, but because my father died, 
in Canada and my aunt died in Canada and the circumstances surrounding their deaths made me think that, you know what, it's probably not that much better in Canada. And that's why I got my C-section in Indonesia. My mom said like, oh, if you're going to give birth, give birth in Canada. It's better here. And I'm thinking, no, probably not. I decided to do mine in Pasik. I found a doctor that I liked and I was just like, where do you practice? I'm going there. So it was in Pasik. The hospital wasn't like the best of the best. Uh, there were a couple problems, like I think I found a cockroach in the bathroom or whatever, but I really liked my doctor and I think that they did a really good job. And um, when, you, when you pay for things yourself, you have choices. But because in Canada, the government pays for it with the tax dollars, they decide what you need and what you're allowed to get. And because I wanted to have a C-section, my only option was to do it in Indonesia because in Indonesia, you still have options. Um, do you want a C-section or do you want a natural birth? It's your decision, unless there's an emergency, yeah. Um, so I decided like, I want a C-section. I've always wanted a C-section. So I booked one in and I planned for it. And a planned C-section is always safer than an emergency C-section. So I wanted it planned and that's what I wanted. And Canada did not offer me that option. And because I trusted uh, my doctor, my Indonesian doctor, um, and because I'm like, I don't get scared of a cockroach here or there. <laughs> Although Anga would not agree with me. Yeah, and I, I had a really good experience there. I guess that's all I wanted to share today. Um, I, I, I guess I'm just kind of rambling. I'm kind of sad. I'm kind of deep the past few days. That's why I didn't upload. Um, so yeah, that's all I have for you today. Is, it's just that story time. Thank you for watching. And I'll see you next time. Bye.